Divine Truth Assistance Group. Group assistance sessions putting principles of divine truth into action. This recording is from the Developing My Loving Self group and is part of an Education in Love series. In the session two, review, conclusion and homework presentation, Jesus reviews and concludes the Removing My Unloving Self two-day session and gives some homework to the participants for the following day. Recorded on the 25th of May 2016 in Nusseville, Queensland, Australia. Well, we now come to the final part of this session. Remember, this session was all about removing my unloving self. And we're just going to do the review, view, review conclusion and homework. So let's uh, just do a quick review because uh, we want to set your homework as well. Now... So cast yourself back to yesterday morning again and the very first discussion was about governing emotions. Remember that? So what did we learn in the governing emotions session? You remember? If we uh, use our hands, eh? And okay. Deidre, what did we learn? There were three groups of governing emotions. Okay, so what were they? Uh, global emotions and beliefs. Yeah. Multiple event-based emotions and beliefs, and single-based, single event-based emotion and beliefs. Yes. So those are the three. Okay. And that, uh, for the want of other terminologies, to be honest, it's just uh, so don't get too hung up on the terminology. It's uh, just stuff that affects everything or most things that you need to process your way through, then it's stuff that affects a lot of things, but not necessarily everything. And then there's stuff that just had one event, and sometimes even a single event can affect everything, but, but, but they're attached to events. So these two are attached to events. This one, not always attached to events in your life. It could be events in previous generations, adding up to something. Now, remember each one of these has positive and negative emotions associated with them. So you can have a global emotion of faith, which is, you know, that, that's an emotion that pulls you through a lot of things, right? A lot of things. In fact, faith would be one of the most positive emotions that a human can develop in that it pulls you through almost every experience you can imagine. And, and then on the negative side, we got the global emotion like this one, refusal to feel terror. Uh, that's another global emotion that has a very negative effect on the whole of our life. So these big emotions have effects right the way through our life. And obviously, the more we can address them and develop the positive ones and remove the negative ones, uh, the more rapidly we can progress, right? So, and particularly that's the case with regard to removal of the two biggest problems we have, which is our refusal to feel the emotion of terror and our fear of pain, our terror of pain, you know, of the feeling, our terror about being emotionally overwhelmed is a part of the, those kind of emotions. Yeah. All right, now what else did we learn in that, in those session, in that session? Remember, we drew the two diagrams. What were they about? Remember that diagram? The two the diagram with the two containers. Whoops. <laughs> it doesn't look much like a container. It's a bit, uh, I'll draw a beaker. <laughs> so two containers. And remember, we were measuring the... Well, trying to look at things honestly about you know, how big our current pain is versus how big our terror is and how big our, the real pain is. And the way we see it is pretty wrong, but this is the way we see it. We've just got a tiny little layer of thing that we call our current pain, and we say, everything's going okay, I'm okay, you know, everything's okay. And, and then we go, but, but gee, it is, I'm terrified of <laughs> dealing with, with that other stuff, you know, the, the, the bottom stuff being our childhood emotion, and all this is terror. And, and God's perspective of it is, like, your current pain's the worst thing you've got, and then there's a little bit of terror to feel, and a bit more, a bit more pain to feel, and you'll be fine, right? And and we 
This is a part of our facade, seeing it like this, isn't it? Wanting to see it like that. Wanting to believe it's like that. Wanting to believe that, you know, we only have a little bit of current pain. When I realised that myself, it was very interesting because <clears throat> I realised that my perspective of my current pain was really untrustworthy. It was I, I couldn't trust my perspective of my current pain. Um, and I had to allow myself to see that actually uh, one thing that was stopping me from processing my terror was believing that my terror, would, the experience would be worse than my current pain is. And, and, and it's interesting, once I went through the process of terror, I realised at the end of that, that actually my terror was nowhere near as bad as what I, my current pain was at the time. I just believed it was worse. It was just a belief, a false belief, based upon you know lots of childhood experiences, but false belief nevertheless. What that helped me do was it helped me actually be to to develop enough desire to actually go through the terror. Once I realised that you know the current pain was the biggest thing. The law of compensation, which we'll learn a lot more about in our next group that we have in November, the law of compensation um, dictates really that your current pain is, going, is, at, is at the highest it possibly could be. The law of compensation ensures that. Yeah. On purpose. Because yeah, all of the law of compensation is, is immediate. Any action you take that's sinful has an immediate compensatory effect in your soul. So, and and by the way, any positive action you take is immediate as well has immediate positive compensatory effect on your soul. And uh, as a result, the law of compensation is ensuring that that right now you're in the worst position that you've ever been in. <laughs> right, and if you choose to sin some more, then you'll be even worse again. <laughs> And that's how the law of compensation works. Yep. We'll talk more about that later. Okay. So in f why do we cover that material, do you think? Any ideas there, Diane? Do you want to... On this side, Diane? Thank you. Uh, to help us face the truth about, you know, like where our, our beliefs false beliefs currently might be about that so that we can start to... Yes, um, that, that's one reason. Yep. Yep. If we go back behind to Pam. Um, doesn't it help to build our aspiration to want to feel... Um, it does. It does. Mm -hmm. uh, anything else? Go back behind to... Oh, Glenda will be fine. Uh, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and right, sorry, you. Oh, I just had a blank. Had a blank? Um... Thanks can be passed. <laughs> yeah, Glenda. To show us that our fear about that fear and pain is unfounded? Yes, that, that our fear of it is worse than the actual experience. Mm. That's very important, isn't it? To understand that our fear is worse than the actual experience. It just seems so huge. It seems huge. And, and just because it seems huge doesn't mean it is. We need to understand that. Mm. We need to have some trust in that. Just because it seems real bad it doesn't mean it's going to be real bad. And this is the trouble with fear is it distorts our perception. It distorts our perception of what is real. So it's going to seem worse than it really is. Yep. So that's another good reason. Another reason? So we've had, there was a few reasons. If we go to Therese. Yes. Um, because the if you deal with the global emotions, it's more economical than... If you deal with the global emotions first, it's more economical than dealing with the multiple and single emotions. Yes, that's the most important reason why we've shared it, because we're trying to save you some heartache and time. <laughs> Can you see that? God's trying to save you heartache and time all the time. God, God's trying to make your life easier like all the time. You, you've got to remember that God's good. He's trying to do these things for you. He's trying to make your life easier all the time. So he, he wants you to process what is going to be in your largest best interest. Makes sense, doesn't it? 
He, want, he wants to help you through the biggest things so that you can have the more joy faster. That, that's how he's... That, and, and once, once I you know, rem remembered these things, because these are things I remember also learning in the first century, once I remembered those things, I realised, yeah, this is all about, also part, a lot about God's economy, his economy of action. He, his economy is driven by his love for you. He, he wants your process to be as economical as he can make it, as easy as he can make it. Right? So he's a bit... Remember I gave the illustration of someone pulling out, you know, barbs that are in your skin uh, or in your flesh. And, you know, if a person's loving, they just won't come along and go, rip, 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 will they? They're like, you'd, be, you'd be in terrible pain the whole time. What they do is they're gentle with it right they're trying to just maneuver it in such a way and gentle they still want to do it they still want to get it out of you as quickly as possible but they don't want you to go through a huge amount of trauma while it's happening right so this is what god's like he's trying to help you go through the least amount of trauma the fastest possible time with the fastest possible time and that's why it's important to understand that those principles about governing emotions yeah Okay, and then we uh, came to our second uh, thing yesterday, which was a second presentation, which was all about deconstructing, wasn't it? The facade, my facade. Now, what's the, what was the th main things we learnt there? What, what are we, we, we were reminded of the desires of the facade so just remind ourselves again what are the desires of the facade what were they if, you know, Karina thanks desensitizing ourselves to our pain All right so it wants to desensitize to that and refusal to feel our terror yes so it wants to not feel that so that's the purpose of the facade so once we know that's the primary driving forces you we can see quite easily that deconstructing our facade is going to be having to deal with two issues of belief systems, isn't it? One issue regarding terror. We need to change our belief systems about terror. And the other is changing our belief systems about pain. But I also said to you that the majority of us won't get there until we've done what? What do we need to do first? Right. So if we come to Rani on this side. Is it accept the facade and deconstruct it? Okay, so we first need to accept the facade, accept that this is what we've got, this is what we're working with, and then we need to go through the process of attempting to deconstruct some of it because if we don't deconstruct some of it, we'll never get to the point where we're willing to feel this, where we're actually willing to feel this terror that existed within us and feel this pain. We'll always be trying to avoid it, always be trying to skip around it, always be trying to just, particularly what most of us are doing is skipping over that and trying to get this all the time. Right. And remember we said that that process is not um, a process that requires your, like the process of feeling this is not going to require your intellect very much. But dealing with this is going to require quite a lot of self-analysis and thought, isn't it? You're going to have to see what you do, see when you're angry. Why am I angry again? Oh, it's another addiction. There's another addiction going by. And in this place, we've got to have... This is called the awakening to sin. So, you know, in the pageant messages, when it refers to the awakening to sin, that, that's the process. Awakening to what is the cause of why you do the unloving things you do. Right? While you're in this cycle, you're not awake to it. You, you just do it. It's just automatic. Do it, do it, do it. The, you feel the compulsion to do it. Like, to, to deconstruct that and to get to a stage where we actually can see that we do it, that we awaken to the fact that we're doing it, we have to deconstruct this to a certain degree so that we can see that we actually do do these unloving things. Otherwise, we think we're loving when we're not. Because remember, our definition of love is the world's definition of love, and that is very much opposed to God's definition of love. So, so, so every time I think I'm loving, I'm probably not. 
when I first start this process, every time I think I'm doing the right thing or being, being loving. So, so for example, I used to think that helping a woman's fear go away was the most loving thing you could do. That's what I used to think. And the majority of you women would agree with that. <laughs> That's why you've got men around you, to help your fear go away, right? And I was taught that from a very young age, and that's what my mother demanded, and she still she still demands, and and so that's uh, you know that's what I believed. I believed that, and then after a while, I started feeling about all these and feeling how fear had created the wars on the planet, and all these different terrible things that have happened to the planet have all been governed by fear, and and then I realised how bad it was to actually nurse a person's fear. That, that we needed to not do that. And so, so that required a whole deconstruction process on my part. I had to cry about the fact that I've done it and uh, you know, for, repent for the fact that I've done it and also then see how bad it is, like get to the point of I'm awakened to the fact that, no, nursing a person's fear is one of the worst things you can do for them. I had to get to that stage where I believed that. Nursing their fear is one of the worst things you can do for a person. And it causes most of the terrible wars and trauma on the planet. It causes the deaths of 100 million children every year on this planet. 50 million, by, 50 million or more by, by um, abortion and another 50 or so through malnutrition. It causes most of the miscarriages on the planet. <laughs> It causes so many things, you know. Millions of people dying every year because of that one thing. And then you, once you start realising the extent of it within yourself, now you've had an awakening to it. Now, once you've had an awakening to something, very, very hard to continue doing it. It's very hard. So now whenever a woman is trying to make, help me, have me make her fear go away, uh, like Mary tries to do it on me. Said, Sorry, darling, can't do that for you. You got to feel this fear. You can't just ignore it anymore, you know. And so that's much better. That's more loving. Yep. But that process was a deconstruction process. Has to happen. Yep. So, so deconstructing my facade. We've seen the primary motivations of the facade. So, what what was the process? Well, we reminded you about the process that it begins with an intellectual process. So there was the two phases, the intellectual side of it, which, which does require the use of your head, your noggin, your logic. And then there's the heart side of it, which is the harder part of it, and that requires the experience of emotion. That requires humility, the development of one of those global qualities, global emotions, humility. It's a global quality that you need to develop in order to engage it. So, so we learned about sort of that and then we made some recommendations to you about that, about you know, how to go about deconstructing the facade, about what you need to focus on first. And obviously, if you can get to this, this terror thing, and allow yourself to feel that, that's going to have a huge impact on your facade, isn't it? Because that's your primary motivation for your facade. That's where it all got seeded. So if you can, if you can get to that, now getting to that is going to be a bit of a process because you're going to have to deconstruct some of the facade and feel some emotions and be comfortable with feeling emotions before you even get to that. But you're also going to have to develop that global emotion of faith, belief that you can get through it, trusting God that God's built you to get through terror. Right? and develop that, put those particular things and develop an aspiration even to have those qualities within you. And, uh, uh, and I also remember that a few days earlier than that, described some of the things I've been through with that terror, what, what it felt like and what it looked like and so forth. So I didn't do that to scare the living daylights out of you. I did that to show you what, what it might look like and for you to be comfortable with that. Does that make sense? All right. And then we came to this morning um, and we were focusing our attention this morning on the subject of releasing pain.
And the very first thing we said is we have to have done some work on accepting our facade and deconstructing our facade before you'll get to the point of releasing your pain. And it makes sense, doesn't it? It's a layers on top of our pain, so we need to get rid of those layers on top of the pain before we can release our pain. And we made some recommendations with you. And, and a lot of this is about remembering events, allowing yourself to remember events and allowing yourself to be sensitive now, emotionally sensitive to what happened in those events. And not just the events of things done to you. They need to be, you need to be, and this is something that we didn't mention probably, but we need to have, you need to be sensitive to the things you've done to others. And that, that's quite hard to do for most people. They're very open to being sensitive to the things that have been done to them, but most people are very shut down to feeling and being sensitive to the things they've done that have harmed other people. Right? And that is a part of this process of releasing pain. Remember, much of our pain is because of what we did to people, how we sinned. And so therefore it's going to need us taking some action in, to, in, the, in harmony with repentance. In other words, coming face to face with the fact of how we've harmed others. And in fact, that's where the majority of the pain is come from. So therefore that's where the majority of our work will be when it comes to releasing pain. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. All right. So that's a very brief summary of where we're at. So Eva, you'd like to say? Yeah, it's just a short question. Uh, would you please define global? What, what do you mean with the word global? Global? Yeah, is it the globe or the whole me, or is it how I affect the globe? Or No, it's, a, it's inside of you there are emotions that are basically affecting almost every type of pain that you've got, right? and therefore affecting all, many or most of your belief systems. And sometimes there's only one or two emotions that affect uh, the whole lot of your system internally. And that's what I'm talking about when I talk about global emotions. I'm talking about these are kind of emotions that once you got rid of that one thing, like hundreds of things change for you. Yeah, so obviously they are the most effective to deal with. Um, if you can deal with that kind of emotion, they're quite intense to deal with, of course, because they, they control so many things. But if you can deal with one of them, then it has an effect on hundreds of things, not just on one little part of your life. Yeah. Okay, so now um, we come to your homework. So most of you would have that page three of, this, uh, of these notes. Let's just have a look at the homework, just so that you can understand it. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions here, but basically I think it's all pretty self-explanatory. So what we're trying to do here with this homework is assist you with this facade and the deconstruction of the facade and understanding global emotions. Does that make sense? <laughs> developing some, a global positive emotion and developing uh, uh, the desire to release some global negative emotions or unloving emotions that you need to release. So, so the first question is, what am I currently doing to develop faith? So this is about what actions are being taken, what messages am I telling myself, what intellectual awareness am I developing, what is the current condition of my aspiration to develop faith? Right. So a lot of times we go, yes, I'm trying that, I'm doing that, but when you sit down and analyse it, you, you do it a minute a day. <laughs> And then you, you have to ask yourself, if I'm only doing it a minute a day, then I've got to start questioning whether I really have much of a desire to do it, you see? And we've got to get honest about this stuff. So, so what am I currently doing to develop faith? How much time do I take? What actions do I take? What message do I tell myself? You know, even those little things you tell yourself in your mind during the day, you know, like, you know, you're about to tell somebody the truth and you go, oh, no, it's pointless to tell them the truth. They won't listen. So there's you undermining your own faith. 
Can you see how that is the case? Basically, you're saying the truth doesn't have power, and that's undermining your faith in the truth. Uh, just that one little message, you know. And then, you know, another time you might be going, you might be going somewhere, and you think you, the person starts talking about something spiritual, and you go, "I could say what I've been learning, but you know that." You know they they might not want to know, and they might not. What are you doing now? You're undermining you're undermining your own faith in what you've learnt. You see, we do it frequently, just frequently messages, and then of course if we're doing that to ourselves, what do you think some spirits around us are doing? Of course, they're giving us the same kind of messages and telling us the same kind of things. So, so good question. What am I currently doing to develop faith? Second question. What am I currently doing to remove my resistance to terror and fear? So, no, so we know we've got to get to this emotion at some point and we've got resistance getting there, this global emotion of terror. We've got resistance getting there. What actions am I taking to remove my resistance? Now, remember, removing resistance. Resistance is all about fear and removing resistance is all about education. So you could ask yourself, what education am I providing myself that invalidates my fear, that helps me see that I can feel my fear as an emotion? Does that make sense? Instead of going, oh, it's all too hard, I can't do it, and all the other messages we're telling ourselves to support our fear. What we need to know the messages we're telling ourselves that will help us overcome our fear. So again, what actions are being taken? What messages am I telling myself? What intellectual awareness is developing about fear itself and terror itself and how much of an impact it has on my life? How much of an impact it has on my ability to change? What am I doing about what's my current aspiration to feel? Resistance. Not, not the actual fear and terror itself, but to feel why you don't want to do it. <laughs> Does that make sense? Let yourself feel why you don't want to. Because if you wanted to, it would already be happening. So obviously we don't want to. So what we need to do is feel why we don't want to. What's going on? What's causing me to feel I don't want to get there? <coughs> so then, then we look at what am I currently doing to experience terror and fear as an emotion. So the first one is about removing my resistance to experiencing it. And this one is about actually experiencing terror. So, for example, when I notice terror come up in my body, what do I do? Do I sit with it as long as I can? Do I, or do I instantly get out and go run away and get some food and go and watch telly? What, what, what do I do? What, what actions do I take when I feel it come up? Or, or do I find myself, I, I feel fear, feel terror come up, and all of a sudden I'm angry, I'm in a rage with the person who just caused it or triggered it. You know, I'm yelling at them and saying, what have you done here? You know, and not, and not so pausing and just going, oh, hang on a sec. Oh, I must be afraid here. Otherwise, I wouldn't be so angry. Right? What am I doing? What actions am I taking? What messages do I tell myself? What intellectual awareness is developing? What's my aspiration to actually feel the emotion of fear? You've got to get to the point where you're sensitive to and tolerant of the emotion of fear. So that's going to take a bit of time, isn't it? If, if we're not feeling fear now and we've got to get to feel fear and even feel terror, which is a, the height of fear, if you like, the most terrible, fearful emotion we can experience, then, then what we've got to do is we've got to get ourselves used to it, used to it as, as a feeling used to feeling it in our body, what it feels like in our body, used to feeling it, breathing through it, used to allowing ourselves to feel it without attacking other people and making or controlling other people or trying to make other people make it help us make it go away. We need to just feel it. The key is to get to the point of allowing the feeling of it. And once we've worked through the barriers, it it will start coming up if we have a desire to feel it. So if we go across to Mel. To get to that point, 
you can't really do that without actually taking some time out, can you? No, you can't. Yeah. You're dead right. You know? It requires you sort of – you've got to remember that in a way you've got to be your own nurse. You know what I mean by that? Like you've got to – what would a nurse do if she saw someone on the bed and, and she was trying to encourage them to feel fear rather than avoid it? And most, unfortunately, most today are trying to avoid it. But what would you do if you were nursing yourself? What, would you, what actions would you take? Well, one of them obviously isn't – you wouldn't surround yourself with a whole people who don't want you to feel it. <laughs> You'd have to spend some time off alone probably so that you can connect to it and feel it. So this is why Mary's spending a fair bit of time alone at the moment because she needs to let herself feel what she's feeling, you see. And it's no good being around anybody, even somebody who's, who, who's already felt it. Because I'm merrily going along going, what are you afraid of? That type of thing. Like, <laughs> you know, she needs to let, validate, allow herself to feel the fear and validate her fear and feel and experience that fear. She needs, and I'm not saying live in it, but she needs to feel it, and and that requires a, probably a lot of alone time, actually. T time to just sit with it, you know. Yep. Because I'd want to be able to set myself the experiment for the next five months to the next yep. workshop yep. of actually <coughs> busying my life less and working less and doing what you said. You woke up, you went for a jog, you sort of laid down for a while I sort of that's where i want to get to yeah um but yeah. then i'm questioning am i just denying and isolating myself and anyway they're things i need to work out but i feel yeah. like what i'm hearing the most is i'm nowhere near the facade stage but it's not going to happen unless i sincerely actually take some real some time in my life yep i agree, um, and I agree. i'm pretty scared about that yeah, yeah 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 even that brings up the fear <laughs> just even thinking of doing it sometimes brings up the fear and and yeah I, I found personally that um the alone time was really good for me really good for me so what i did was i planned my life so that i had two or three days where i was with people and a few days when i wasn't with people so that i could feel about what happened when i was with people a and feel on my own without anybody telling me what to feel or how to feel or what i should feel or any of those things and that helped me greatly, actually, to connect to my personal feelings. And I had to remind myself of a few basic core principles, and one of them was, I need to feel what I feel, I need to think what I think, I need to, you know, even do things like smell what I smell and taste what I taste, and you know what I mean? Like, you need to be allow yourself to... to Firstly, focus on what is your feelings as, as, and that's different to what other people's feelings would be about that same issue. No two people are probably going to have the same feelings about the same issue unless they've, you know, grown up exactly the same way in exactly the same situation. You know, quite, sometimes you see twins uh, who have very similar feelings, but it's rare for anybody even in the same family to have the same feelings because we're dif different personalities. And so we have a different way of assessing everything we have. So the key is to uh, allow your feelings about what you feel. And particularly with fear, that requires you sitting with it. Yeah. Mm. And not being, not assessing. Ev the trouble with fear is that we, we're taught to assess everybody else before we assess ourselves. And we need to break that cycle and we need to learn to assess ourselves first where where i'm at first what's going on with me first what you know that's the thing i can fix right i can't fix you i can fix me i can encourage you i can inspire you but i can't fix you i can only fix me mm. bruce you wanted to say or you've you're done yep Okay, so getting back to our session that we just covered. So basically what we've done is we've covered these three main points, which are, the, I feel, the main things that you'll need to address in terms of removing your unloving self. Now, your unloving self involves also understanding sin and removing sin, doesn't it? You can see quite clearly 
that that's the case. So we'll be spending more time on these subjects later, and particularly when we talk about sin, we'll be spending more time on addictions and facade and what they are and all those kind of things. But but we feel that before we cover that material, we do need to have a bit of a discussion about God's laws so there's a better understanding about God's laws and how you can engage them. And uh, And so you can actually, after you've done the session about God's laws, you, which will be our next group um, in November, once you've done that, you'll be able to start applying some of those laws to the removal of your unloving self and see how those laws interact. You experiment with that. So that's what I'd recommend for you to do. Okay. So there's your homework. See how you go with that. Now... Before we let go, I'd just like to explain the next two days that we have. We have day's break, and then we start at 10.30 on the, on the Friday. And that'll be our last two days coming up. The focus there is, is on developing our loving self, and so part of that is recognising our real self. That, that, uh, those two days is going to be information heavy. So, so No. <laughs> So, so because there's actually, um, the way we've structured it is that there's actually one more presentation on the second day than you're used to having, um, where you don't get a chance to ask questions. And so, so that means that, you know, it's quite a lot of information. We thought about trying to include the questions and everything, but there's too much material to cover. So, so what, what we're wanting to do is present to you that material and hopefully, again, if you have questions about that material, you'll email those questions in and we'll be able to discuss those questions maybe at a later time with some of those things that we're not able to do questions on at the time. It's uh, quite an important part, this part, real self part. And, and in fact, it, it, it will become your favourite part at some point in your future. Um, understanding and recognising and developing your real self and it's very important to see, you know, what God has created as a part of your real self, what God gifts God's given you to develop your real self, and also what God has given you in terms of what how you're going to have to exercise your will to develop your loving self. And uh, these are the kind of subjects we're going to cover in the two days following. So, so enjoy your day off. Apparently, it's going to be warmer tomorrow, so so that'd be nice. And. Uh, and we'll see you on Friday morning at 10.30. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.